All right, let's go ahead and get started with my quick announcements. I'm gonna make them quick. So we welcome you all here to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people. We acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone tribal groups as the families, families as the rightful stewards in the lands in which we reside here in our beautiful Bay Area. SFPL encourages you to learn more about native culture and land rights, and the library is committed to hosting events and providing educational resources available on topics such as land rights, Bay Area community, tribal community, and first person culture. We also want to acknowledge right now Black Lives Matter and this painful situation that our country seems to remain in and continually come back to and know that the library is not a neutral institution and we stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and towards working towards, um, you know, looking at our own systemic racism in our organization and what to do about it. Um, the library does all this stuff by providing free and factual and, you know, factual information. That's the key. So I will be sending, by the way, I'm Anissa, I'm your librarian host today. I'll send a follow-up email that contains all sorts of great links and resources towards Black lives and indigenous culture, as well as um, links that Susan will have about today's panel, I mean, today's uh, presentation. So just some quick library announcements. This is today's presentation here we see. And oh, I want you to know that um, California Native Plants will be back in September. So September 26th, Shade Gardening with California Native Plants. Register for that or catch us on the live YouTube. And we have a suffrage program coming up on Wednesday. So America's first suffrage march and the San Francisco women who led it. We are now about approaching into August is over, if you can believe this. So we are going to be celebrating Viva, our Latinx Heritage Month, and we'll be spanning that out through September, October, and a little bit into November. And we have amazing authors. I'm so excited, particularly about our one uh, on the same page, which is a campaign we attempt to get everyone to read the same book. And our book for September and October is Benjamin Box Sierra's Pura Neta. And that is a sequel to um, Barrio Bushido, a long awaited sequel. Um, Benjamin's an amazing guy. He's a local, he's an educator and an activist. He teaches at City College and he's just amazing. So I love him to death. And I know you'll love his books. His books are um, really big in like uh, the barrio literature scene. And so he's very popular and he's a very great writer. And just from the very first sentence is a hard hit. So please come check that out. And he's gonna be in conversation with Luis Rodriguez. Like my mind is blown. I can't even believe the amazing people I get to promote and, and it's just amazing. Thankful for my job. Okay, I'm gonna be quick now. Lots of art. Romanez will be talking about the Pan American mural. Um, Calixto Robles, if you don't know him, a great artist, amazing artist here in the Mission District. And um, he had a exhibit with the Arts Commission pre-COVID or just before COVID. So sadly, his exhibition did not get to happen, and it's, his theme is Water for Life. So we're going to do a studio tour with Blake Stowe, a very generous man. Um, quickly going to go through. So please take your census if you haven't done this. This is so important, and I have seen lots of statistics. It's a little pet project in my library. Um, we in San Francisco are only at about 37, 47% rate of people being counted. It is so important. It's exactly what they want is for us not to get counted. Everybody counts in your household, babies, all of them. Please tell everyone to tell everyone to take their census. It brings in $20,000 to our community each count. So it's so important. It is so important. I can't even stress enough how important it is. So come to your census, San Francisco. Someone will be knocking on your door too if you don't take your census. <clears throat> Finally, we are trickling open SFPL to go now open, you know, depending on the firestorms and the weather and the all of that we did have to close down this week due to um, respiratory issues and you know that kind of stuff. So wear your mask. So many reasons to wear your mask now. And 
San Francisco offers free COVID testing, sf.gov slash city test sf. Big thanks to our friends of the San Francisco Public Library and support them. Go check out their social media. And again, my name's Anissa. I will be sending you a follow-up email tomorrow and it'll have all these great links to all these amazing resources and ways to find us. And anything Susan has for me to send to you, I will send to you as well. I am now going to stop sharing my screen. So Susan may take her screen over. Let's see, I am gonna do that. Oh, what happened? Susan, you might have to steal the screen. Stop, share, there we go. All right, Susan. And I'll give a little intro to Susan. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Well, I thought I was going to give an intro to Susan. I don't see your intro here. Susan, tell us about yourself. <laughs> I'm, going on, I'm going on mute now. Hi, I'm Susan Karasoff from the California Native Plant Society. I garden in San Francisco and uh, take an engineering approach to it and an only the, the most robust survive. I'm with the California Native Plant Society. Bob Hall from the California Native Plant Society is monitoring the Zoom question and answer and Anissa from the library is monitoring the YouTube chat. So I'll talk for about 45 minutes and answer questions for about 10 minutes. There's going to be a lot of information today. This presentation is available on the San Francisco Library's YouTube channel. And so you'll be able to review the slides afterwards, uh, freeze frame, get information from it. There is a lot of information in this presentation. So much new information has been published in the last five years. So if you have been gardening for pollinators for a long time, there's, there's new information out there. It's a lot of fun. Thank you for your interest in gardening for pollinators. Every plant that we plant makes a difference and contributes to a thriving ecosystem. So let's get started. We'll discuss why plant native plants, native pollinator habitats, native gardening for pollinators, success stories, and pollinator garden resources. We'll look at butterflies, hummingbirds, and bees. So why plant native plants? Insects are declining. And it turns out that when insects decline, they take the rest of the ecosystem with them. We can measure the effects of insect declines on bird declines because those, those birds, at least the terrestrial birds eat caterpillars in their baby phase. The terrestrial birds find caterpillars and then feed them to their baby birds. If we don't have insects in our landscapes and we don't have caterpillars, then we don't have birds. And planting in San Francisco is complex. In our seven mile, by seven mile city, we have a variety of different kinds of soil we have three fog and wind belts, and we have variable rainfall from year to year and from month to month. We have a 20 inch average rainfall, but the rainfall can range from as little as seven inches to as much as 50 inches, depending on us getting some atmospheric rivers. We have a lot of variation and our native plants are adapted to our soils and our fog and our wind and our rainfall. Native plants are the base of the food, food web. Those, e each one of these plants supports a different number of caterpillars and in fact may support different caterpillars. Doug Tallamy, an insect researcher at the University of Delaware and his graduate students discovered and, and did the, the research to determine how many plants each, how many caterpillars each plant supports. And it turns out they're different. They're different in Delaware, they are different in California, 
The top three seem to be willows, oaks, and cherries in each part of the United States. It takes 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to feed one nest of chicks. So we must have caterpillars in our landscape if we want to have birds. So who are our pollinators? Plants reproduce by sharing pollen with other similar plants. 80% of plants need pollinators to carry pollen to another plant. Bees, butterflies, moths, hummingbirds, ants, beetles, flies, bats, midges, and wasps can all function as pollinators. Plants and their pollinators co-evolved together. Those insect pollinators are adapted to specific plant leaf chemicals. So because, and, and plants don't want to be eaten. So they have ways to prevent themselves from being eaten. Many of those ways include chemical defenses. Those caterpillars evolved with those plants and can eat somewhere between one and just a few leaves on plants. So it's important that if we want caterpillars in our landscape and we want butterflies in our landscape, that we plant those native plants that they need to eat. Most caterpillars can't adapt to other food. So these icons are gonna be our guides through the presentation. We'll be talking about number of butterfly and moth caterpillar species hosted by plants. We'll be talking about the good bee plants and the good hummingbird plants. And we'll take a look at our soil types throughout our clay, clay soil, sandy soil, and rocky soil. Let's look at native pollinator habitats. What do butterflies need? Butterflies need those caterpillar food plants. They, they need our native plants. And when you see chewed leaves in your garden, that's the sign of a healthy ecosystem. So celebrate your chewed leaves that made some little caterpillar really happy. And either that caterpillar grew up to be a beautiful butterfly or grew up to be bird food. Either way, our ecosystem benefits. Butterfly habitats also want you to leave the leaves on the ground, please. If there are leaves on the ground, then when caterpillars have eaten their fill, they can crawl off and look for a place to hide. Birds still want to eat caterpillars when they're in their cocoons. So if you have leaves on the ground, it gives them some place that they can avoid being eaten by the birds. Adult butterflies can eat all kinds of, of plants. They can eat nectar from all kinds of plants. They happen to like flatter plants so they can see them and land on them and drink nectar and then move on. So shallow depth flowers are preferred, but not necessarily required. And then in San Francisco, we have a bunch of hills. And so we have a lot of butterflies that evolved to meet their mates on the tops of hills. So you'll find butterfly males hanging out on the tops of hills. Go to any of our hilltops, especially in August, and you'll get a chance to see butterflies looking to meet each other. The butterfly life cycle starts with the mother butterfly finding that larval plant. This is the cycle for our beautiful pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. She can use exactly one plant to lay her eggs on for those caterpillars to survive. And that is the California Dutchman's pipe vine. She lays her eggs on the larval plant, the pipe vine plant. She, the, the eggs and the early caterpillar phases are shown on that leaf, which has been chewed. Look how beautiful that is. There's beauty in that imperfection. It's that wabi-sabi concept. It's gorgeous, celebrate that. You get that final caterpillar phase on the larval plant, plant. And then the caterpillar crawls off to find some place to hide when it's in its cocoon when it's finished evolving in its cocoon, it becomes an adult, and then it can drink nectar from all kinds of plants. So you tend to only have one or a few larval plants, leaves on the ground are good, and many nectar plants that the butterflies can use. These are how our local habitats support that butterfly life cycle. So here's just a few of our local plants. We have Lupine, 
beautiful, supports over 70 caterpillar species, including the endangered mission blue butterfly and the eastern tailed blue. Our coast buckwheat supports the endangered coastal green hair streak butterfly and the gray hair streak butterfly and the Ackman blue butterfly. The California lilac, with that vibrant blue color, supports over a hundred different butterflies and moths, including that fabulous Ceanothus moth and the California tortoiseshell butterfly. California lilac are a local version of Ceanothus thrissoflorus, but there are California lilacs adapted to all kinds of soil types. The lupine in the coast buckwheat can only live in sandy soil. Different California lilacs are adapted to sand or clay or rock. They need full sun. The lupines in the coast buckwheat because they evolved in our dune and dune scrub plant communities can take a lot of fog and wind and shade, but the California lilac needs full sun. We have all kinds of ways and all kinds of beautiful plants to help support our caterpillar species here in San Francisco. These are just a, a few of the beautiful flatter flowers we have that butterflies like to, adult butterflies like to use. The advantage of planting a native flat flower for them to use is that those plants can also support caterpillars on their leaves. Coyote bush is a wonderful plant, blooms in the summer and into the fall. It's a fantastic flat plant for those butterflies to use. Our woolly sunflower, the sea pink, the coast buckwheat that we just saw as a larval plant, also important as a nectar plant. Pacific aster and seaside daisy, all wonderful flat plants for you to have in your landscape to encourage butterflies to drop by and get a drink. Different shaped flowers attract different pollinators. Flatter, shallower, shallower flowers attract not only adult butterflies, but also tiny insects and smaller bees. The larger bees tend to like the lantern sizes or the cup sizes or, or cup shapes. And the hummingbirds love tubular flowers. They're known to love tubular flowers mostly because those tubular flowers have nectar at the bottom and the tiny insects are a little bit concerned about going in there. They could get lost, they can drown in a pool of nectar. So the hummingbirds have fewer competitors when they have a tubular shaped flower. They still have some, but they have fewer. Let's look at hummingbirds. Hummingbirds would prefer to live in our landscape year round. They have some habitat needs, including food 365 days a year. They tend to be territorial, so they would like a tall place to perch on to survey their territory. They're known for drinking nectar plants from all kinds of plants, but they also like to eat tiny little insects. So tiny little insects need those shallow, flatter plants that we just talked about. So having some of those in your insect, in your landscape will support those, the, the protein that the hummingbirds need to eat. When you see hummingbirds flying back and forth in short patterns across your garden, looking like they lost their keys, they're eating tiny little insects out of the air. They're like little flying tortilla chips, they're wonderful. So plant some shallow nectar plants in addition to those tubular plants to provide a year round buffet for your hummingbird. They appreciate a water feature, but if one of your neighbors or nearby park has it, that will be good enough for your hummingbird. So let's take a look at the year round flower buffet. You benefit from having year round flowers in your garden because they're gorgeous and the hummingbird benefits from having year round flowers because he or she doesn't have to leave. They can stay, defend their territory and get breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks all day, every day. The most important plants to plant for a hummingbird buffet are November to February. Our current, the manzanita and the barberry, the most imp important plants you can put in your landscape. Very, very few plants bloom in our winter rainy season. If you think like a plant, California native plants and other plants that have adapted to live here are spending the rainy season working on their root system. They don't know how much rain they're going to get throughout the year. And so they don't wanna expend a lot of energy on flowers until they know how much 
rain they're going to get. It's one of the reasons we have so many plants blooming in March through May. At that point, they know about how much, how much water they got, and so they know how much energy they can spend flowering. So what the current and barberry and manzanitas recognized was, hey, I don't have to compete for pollinators if I bloom November to, to February. I take a risk in terms of blooming because I don't know how much rain I got, but it's worth it. Manzanitas want full sun. Each one of them is adapted to a different soil type, so they aren't going to play very well on soils when you shop for a manzanita. Make sure you have that full sun and make sure you understand your soil type. Barberries can do very well anywhere between um, full shade to full sun, and they work well in a variety of soils. They support fewer pollinators than in terms of their, their leaves but uh, than the manzanita, but you don't need full sun for them. The currants prefer at least part shade, if not full shade. They support over a hundred caterpillars on their leaves in addition to having gorgeous pink flowers for our hummingbirds. So pick one of these. They do really well in San Francisco because they are adapted here and they will keep your hummingbirds very happy. Our dry summers are another time when plants stop, stop blooming. So the kinds of flowers that we have available in the summer, California fuchsia, the Malborosa and the Dudalea are all wonderful plants to include in your landscape if you have the soils for them. Let's look at bees. Bees also need a, a year-round flower buffet. So there isn't a bee species that lives year-round. They all go through a hibernation phase. But because we have so many different bee species, they, they all live at different times. So having a year-round flower buffet is wonderful for them. Bees are known, and in fact, especially adapted for gathering pollen. They are the most effective pollinators in our landscape. If you have a home fruit and vegetable garden and you want to make sure you've got bees because they're the best pollinators, please make sure you've got that year around flower buffet to attract them to your garden and keep them in your garden. Bees use protein to put together little baby bee lunch boxes. And they also eat a little bit of protein, uh, pollen for themselves because that's protein for them. Nectar plants are also needed. It's like having an energy drink. There's a little bit of nectar used to stick the pollen together for the baby bee lunch boxes. The bees drink the, the nectar themselves as well. Different flower shapes and different flower types attract different sized bees. So having a variety of flower shapes in your land, landscape is also a beneficial. Many bees are generalist feeders but they all have specialist habitat, habitat needs. Bumblebees, for instance, nest in bare ground. Some bees nest in hollow stems. The middle picture there is the blue elderberry that has wonderful flat flowers, attractive leaves for caterpillars and has hollow stems for our stem nesting bees. We have bees that nest in dead wood and we have knees that bees that nest in our dunes, especially when those dunes are covered with native plants. Leaves on the ground are just as important for bees as they are for caterpillars. Queen bees don't wanna be eaten while they're hibernating and birds would find those delicious, adult birds would, so they don't wanna be eaten and they need some place to hide. So please leave leaves on your ground and include shallow flowers not only for the smaller bees, but when boy bees get kicked out of the nest, they need some place to sleep at night. So if around 4.30 in the afternoon, you're out hiking and you see a boy, you see a bee asleep on a flower, that boy, that, that bee's not dead. That's a boy bee taking a nap. We have many types of native bees. It's one of the things that makes our ecosystem resilient. We have a lot of different kinds of specialist pollinators. We have generalist feeders. We've got bumblebees and mining bees and silver digger bees and mason bees and tiny metallic sweat bees and that vibrant ultra green, green sweat bee. And we have specialist feeders, squash bees, sunflower bees, and morning glory bees. 
those bees are specialist on the pollen from those plants, specifically for their baby bee lunch boxes. They're able and willing to have nectar from all kinds of plants, but they are specialist on that kind of pollen. So if you're interested in having those kinds of bees in your landscape, those are the plants you need to plant. Let's take a look at the bee year round buffet. You'll notice that the same plants from November to February, the currant, the manzanita, and the barberry are here for the bees as well as the hummingbirds. It's cold, it's rainy, it's windy, and there are queen bumblebees out looking for a, a nice home for their family, someplace with a lot of food. And I've found that if I have these in my landscape, I attract the queen bees, and then they stay and they pollinate my plants all year. March to May, lots of wonderful plants available. So many plants are, are blooming, again, because they know how much rain they got. These are just some of the wonderful plants we have in our landscape that not only support the bees, but when you look at those numbers, you can see that they also support caterpillars. It gets drier in the summer, and there's a different set of plants that the bees like to nectar from and get pollen. These plants will also support the tiny insects and the butterflies. So you can support many different kinds of pollinators in your year round landscape. Let's talk about gardening for native pollinators. This is what a successful native pollinator garden looks like to me. There are bees in it, there are hummingbirds in it, there's chewed leaves and there's caterpillars. I am so proud of this, this is our garden. You can't tell from looking at the larger view that there's chewed leaves in there. So celebrate those chewed leaves, they're beautiful. Please plant during the rainy season. We talked about plants expecting to grow their roots during the rainy season. That's the best time to put in your plant and be most su successful with it. Our chapter of the California Native Plant Society, the Yerba Buena chapter has specific helpful handouts online, specifically for butterflies, for bees, for hummingbirds, and for edible native plants. So that's a good place to go and find more information about the plants that we are talking about today. If you have pots on a balcony or a roof garden or a flower box in your window, shallow rooted annuals are great plants to plant. We talked about all of these other plants spending the rainy season working on their, their root systems. Annuals have a very short life cycle. They live fast and die young, so they have very short root systems. And a short root system is perfect for a pot or a window box. These, and they have to attract pollinators. Regardless of how little rain they got, they got in a year, they have to attract pollinators and they have to go to seed. So, Take a look at just how beautiful and vibrant those flower shapes and colors are. They want to attract pollinators. They are all trying to be as attractive as possible. Some of them bloom in the spring, some of them bloom in the summer. These are all wonderful plants to have in your pots. And when they go to seed at the end of their lifetime, Leave a little bit of that seed for some of those adult birds that like to eat seeds, but collect some of it and you get free plants the next year. So much fun to put annuals in pots. Bulbs also do really well in pots. If you think about an onion, an onion is the underneath part of that particular plant. That's pretty shallow. So it's going to do really well in a pot or a window box. So these are just a few of the bulbs that California has. We have, species that no one else has. Uh, Ethereal spear you may not have heard of before. It's gorgeous, it blooms in, blooms in May. Blue dicks are wonderful in terms of providing nectar. And uh, the Douglas iris can deal with a lot of shade. California has 70 onion species. So you're familiar with onions, onions, leeks, garlic, that's all in the same family. These 70 onion species, all in the same family, all entirely edible and very attractive to pollinators. So they're wonderful to have in a landscape. And our onion species support over 20 different caterpillars. So definitely worth having. And succulents. Our succulents evolved 
on our rocky outcrops and in our sandy areas, right around our dune systems. They don't support as many um, caterpillars as some of our other plants, but they do support some important ones. That stone crop is the only larval plant for the San Bruno elfin butterfly that is endangered. If you like succulents and you've got sand or rocks in your pots, these are the plants for you. If you've got a larger space, planting plants together in plant communities is, is a wonderful way to make our landscape more resilient. San Francisco has grasslands and oak woodlands and riparian areas, which is a fancy word for creekside. It means it gets water all the time because we have underground streams in San Francisco. We have coastal dune scrub and we have dunes. These plant communities, when planted together, are resilient to, to climate change. They have been evolving together, together as plants and together with our pollinators for hundreds and thousands of years. They can put up with everything California weather has to bring and, and live through it. Fewer than 1% of San Francisco's street trees are native. That's an indicator of how we historically planted. We would take any plant that lived or any pretty plant and put it in our landscape. Take a look at that picture and see how much of our landscape is paved. Every plant is an opportunity to feed our ecosystem. Our ecosystem needs our help. Between the paving and the fragmenting of landscapes, the replacement of native plants, the introduction of invasive plants, which please don't plant an invasive plant, and poisoning our landscape because we used to think bugs were bad, our insects and our pollinators need our help. But we have the ability to do that. You've, you've all shown up today because you care about our pollinators and we know more than we used to know. Let's talk about some restoration success stories. The Presidio used to have the same invasive plants on their dunes that we all have, ice plant and jabata grass. They removed that from some of their dunes and, and replaced it with native plants for those dunes and an extinct bee, a bee we thought was extinct, the silver digger bee, came back. It's a generalist feeder, but it needs that very specific habitat to live. Dunes with native plants, and we get our silver digger bee back. Every pollinator type we have makes us more resilient. There are two volunteer organizations in San Francisco who are working on restoring our pollinator communities. One is Nature in the City. The coastal green hair streak is an endangered butterfly. The males like to live on those hilltops. And what the Nature in the City group has done is coordinate with San Francisco Recreation and Parks Department to make sure that not only are there plants in those, on those hilltops in those parks to support the male butterflies, but there's a, a corridor of food between those hilltops to support the females. The males just live on the top of the hills and the females are the ones who fly back and forth to meet mates and provide genetic variation. They need us to plant those larval plants like the coast buckwheat and they need us to plant nectar plants, flat, lovely nectar plants like that, um, sea pink, so that they have something to eat and some place to lay their eggs as they fly back and forth between the hills. That is a wonderful place to go hike, go see the butterflies on the hills. And if you live in that area, please consider adding those plants to your landscape. It will help us create that thriving community. San Bruno Mountain Watch is the volunteer organization that coordinates with San Mateo Parks to restore our landscape on San Bruno Mountain. San Bruno Mountain has two endangered butterflies and one threatened one, the endangered San Bruno elfin and the Mission Blue and the, the threatened variable checker spot. San Bruno Mountain Watch volunteers remove invasive plants, 
There is a nursery you can volunteer in that will grow plants, the, the larval plants and the nectar plants, and then replace those plants in those ecosystems. It's a wonderful place to go hiking and taking pictures and uh, helping us document the, existing, the existence of these butterflies and other pollinators and wildlife in that landscape. Let's talk about resources. We'll talk about the CalScape but, uh, plant butterfly selection tool, sources for native plants, the National Wildlife Federation plant butterfly selection tool, butterfly and pollinator organizations, pollinator bird and ecosystem books, and iNaturalist to help you explore local pollinators. California Native Plant Society has the CalScape tool. This helps us find plants in our landscape that will be local for us. CalScape right now has a 10 mile radius, which when you remember that San Francisco is seven miles by seven miles and a bunch of different soil types means that when you get recommendations from CalScape for plants, just double check that soil type. I have clay soil, I can't grow the sand plants. So make sure that you're buying the plants that are right for your soil. CalScape as of 2019, so just last year, added butterfly information. So you can go back and forth between searching for butterflies and the kinds of plants that, that they need for larval plants. You can also look from the plant and see what kind of butterflies are available. Calscape also offers nursery information, including places where you can buy annual seed and bulbs and succulents. Outside of California, Doug Tallamy's lab was paid by the US Forest Service to just to compile all of the existing information about butterflies and moth use of different plants. And so that information is, has been compiled into a database that is hosted by the National Wildlife Federation. CalScape will take you all the way down to the plant species level. National Wildlife Federation has these plants at the general level. So for instance, a, a plant species is the big leaf maple for, for CalScape, but for National Wildlife Federation, you'll only get maple. But it's more information than we used to have, and this information was only available as of 2016. It helps you with trees and shrubs and smaller plants, and you can go back and forth between the butterflies that you're looking for and the plants that you're looking for. If you're outside of California, contact your states Native Plant Society, and they'll be able to provide your, your native and local species. We have a variety of wonderful pollinator conservation organizations that are US-wide. There's the Xerxes Pollinator Conservation Group. They have information on their website. They have a wonderful YouTube channel with much more detailed information on conserving each type of pollinator. There is Monarch Watch. They are specifically dedicated to talking and, and mapping and helping people plant for monarchs. You may wonder why I didn't talk about monarchs in this presentation before. It's because monarchs aren't native to San Francisco. They migrate and they, so they are supposed to migrate past San Francisco to other areas. Any place within five miles of the coast in California is not supposed to plant milkweed. The milkweed that if you live east of the east of that five mile area that you are supposed to plant for our Western monarchs is the narrow leaf milkweed. Please don't plant that showy orange one. That's the one that feeds the, the Eastern uh, monarchs. Monarch Watch is very useful for finding information about where to see monarchs in California, which, which milkweed to use and doing a monarch count in the winter time. Oregon State University has a pollination podcast. Oregon and California share a lot of the same plants and pollinators. It's been a very useful uh, way for me to learn more about my pollinators and very, very fun podcast to listen to. They do focus on bees. They have some butterfly podcasts. Lots of fun researchers, graduate students, land managers. A lot of fun to listen to. Doug Tallamy, the insect researcher at University of Delaware who did that groundbreaking research discovering that, oh dear, 
different native plants support different, different numbers of caterpillars and introduced plants only support between zero and two caterpillar species. He has a couple of books out that are in, intended for general audiences and the San Francisco Library has not only the books, but the eBooks. I strongly recommend you read them. They're a lot of fun. Bringing Nature Home was written back in 2009 with the data that he had at the time from the University of Delaware. And Nature's Best Hope just came out in 2020. It's a wonderful book. Talami also has two California-centric lectures. Both were done from the Native California Native Plant Society, one in 2018 for Southern California and one in 2019 for the California Native Plant Society Santa Clara Valley chapter. They had a wonderful insect apocalypse conference and all of those lectures are available online at their YouTube channel. Tug Talamy has a website, Bringing Nature Home, and all of that data that he compiled is on the National Wildlife Federation website. There are not one but two world-class bee research organizations in the San Francisco Bay Area. One is Gretchen Lebune's lab at San Francisco State University. She wrote a fantastic book called The Bee-Friendly Garden, helping us understand what bees we have and how to plant for them. Gordon Frankie's team at the University of California Berkeley Bee Lab did the same. They wrote California Bees in Bloom. The library has both books. They are wonderful books. Gordon Frankie's lab has a website called Help a Bee. Very useful with bee, research, bee information. And Gretchen Lebune's lab has a citizen science project called The Great Sunflower, which is a project which counts bees at certain times of the year. David Sibley has written and illustrated a variety of books for birds across the United States landscape. He has a specific book for a field guide to birds of Western North America. He has illustrations of all of our Western birds, including males, females, and juveniles. So it helps identify which birds you're seeing in your landscape. It's a fabulous book. Golden Gate Audubon is a wonderful local organization if you're interested in learning more about bees. They have lectures, free lectures, and volunteer opportunities. Cornell Lab of Ornithology Lab has an eBird site, and they've got some fabulous information that's recent mapping bird migration that may also interest you. iNaturalist is written and hosted by the California Academy of Sciences, so our local science museum. It is a worldwide citizen science application and it lets us explore pollinators. So you can explore the pollinators that are, are near you and you can explore the pollinators that interest you. You can put in specific pollinator names or you can put in just general pollinator, pollinator names, butterflies or hummingbirds or very specific ones to find out what pollinators are near you. Also, you can look at the, at the plants that are near you. You can discover where you wanna go take a hike because it's August, it's good hiking weather. And you can go see those pollinators, see what plants they're using and think about what plants are going to be the most fun to put in your landscape. And then perhaps work with your neighbors to put together a pollinator corridor so that they link to the larger areas green areas that San Francisco Recreation and Park has to our green spaces and um, to the Department of Public Work green spaces and to the other green spaces around us so that our pollinators can move back and forth and have a wonderful snack in between. So many thanks to all of the people on iNaturalist who are wonderful at taking pictures of hummingbirds, birds, bees, and plants and to the professionals who take pictures of birds, bees, plants, and caterpillars. Those are remarkably hard to find pictures of. This is the second in a series of three Gardening with Native Plants series for the San Francisco Library. The next, the next topic is Shade Gardening with California Native Plants on Saturday, September 26th at one o'clock. The previous presentation, Edible Native Fruits and Vegetables in San Francisco, was in July and it is available on the San Francisco Library's YouTube channel. We are the California Native Plant Society. We have free lectures 
free hikes when it's not COVID, and lots of volunteer opportunities to take out invasive plants and plant new plants. We have information on our website, plant lists for bees, for birds, and for, for hummingbirds, and for butterflies. Thank you so much for being here today. Now we'll take questions. I am going to read the questions out loud because the people on YouTube can't see the Zoom chat. So Kathy is asking about clay soil. Do you, does, do you need to worry about soil amendments to plant a successful native plant? So the good news is I'm too lazy to amend my soil. As long as you're planting a plant that expects clay soil into clay soil, you don't need to amend it. You do need to water it when you plant it, but you don't need to amend it. If you do what I did and try to plant a sand plant in clay soil, then you would need to amend it. Otherwise it will die. So where can you buy these California native plants? Calscape has a, a nurseries page. Let me go back to the Calscape. Oops. Site. Calscape has a nursery page showing you where you can buy the plants and the bulbs and the seeds. Kathleen, I will not be doing similar talks for other, other areas like Sonoma County. I am a garden in, in San Francisco, so I'm only qualified to talk about San Francisco. There is the Hallberg Butterfly Garden in uh, Santa Rosa, so I would recommend that you check their website. They post their information to, um, to iNaturalist, but they have a plant list and butterfly list on their website and they are open for people to visit and they're they're extraordinary. I was lucky to meet Louise Hallberg when she was still alive and she knew her ecosystem back and forth. She she sold that as a butterfly garden but it's got so much more than butterflies in it. Will hummingbirds teach their young the location of food sources? your hummingbirds have done so. That's fantastic. They might, because my garden is specifically intended as a year round food source, my hummingbirds haven't had to do that. I, I like to let my pollinators be lazy, just roll out of bed and find food, but they may very well. That's wonderful to find out that your hummingbirds have that kind of behavior. Ooh, wonderful, Catherine, you're asking about what kind of reeds you need to make a solitary bee habitat. Um, so please take a look on the Calscape website, look for your local area and look for, it. it's not just reeds, it's bunch grasses. Look under the grasses. Almost all of our grasses are bunch grasses. Those do help with solitary bee nesting sites and I appreciate you asking about that. So look for your look for your local bunch grass. That'll be the right thing to do. Pet friendly pollinators. They're really they're all pet friendly. I, I've never been stung by a bee. They don't want to sting me as long as your dog isn't. I'm assuming we're talking dogs digging where the bee has her nest, and you can put a little a little temporary fence around it, the kind of cage you might put around tomatoes around her nest area to make sure that, that your dog doesn't dig there. But otherwise, I, I've never seen an issue. We don't have a dog yet. But I haven't seen an issue with visiting dogs in any of our pollinators. Yeah, and, and native bees just, they just don't sting. And boy bees, even boy honeybees don't sting. So they should be pretty pet friendly. Uh, the, the butterflies, really don't care as long as you don't, as long as your dog isn't eating a caterpillar because some of those, when I talked about the chemical defenses that the, that the plants have, 
those caterpillars not only need to eat those plants, but they acquire some of those plant toxins. So you wouldn't want to let your, your pet eat a caterpillar. Are pollinators significantly different from the East Bay? We share a lot of the same pollinators. There is more information on Gordon Frankie's website because UC Berkeley is based in the East Bay, but we do, we share a lot of the same pollinators and we share a lot of the same plants. We have a few different coastal plants than you may have because our soils are different. Our, our dune and coastal dune scrub plants expect a lot of fog and wind and they may not be as successful for you. So you may have a different buckwheat species You'll definitely have some sage species that we don't have. Uh, those are wonderful. You've got black sage and purple sage, and we, we only have that one hummingbird sage. So similar, but not the same. Check Calscape as well. Oh, wonderful. Oh, <laughs> Kathy is saving the caterpillars so she'll have more butterflies. Louise Hallberg did the same. It's, that's a wonderful thing we to do. Bonnie, you're asking about registering known poll pollinator nests. I'm not sure who you were registering them with. If you take a picture of pollinator nests in your garden and put it on a naturalist, that's very helpful for researchers. A lot of researchers are using iNaturalist to help them understand how, back, how people's backyards are supporting the ecosystem around them. So if that's what you mean, that's... That's what uh, we have. So what plants are working for checker spots today in San Francisco? So the variable checker spot uses monkey flower, which is really easy to grow. It does want full sun and it's a really pretty plant. Double check the Calscape website. It will have the additional uh, plants that the checker spots use. Each one needs a different kind of plant, like the swallowtails all use different plants. So triple check to make sure that you're getting the pollinator plants that you need. Pollinate, but Calscape's got that information now. It's so helpful. When planting clay, how do I water new plants? Uh, you're trying three days back to back, at least once a week. Water once a week for clay, at least. For new plants, I water every couple of days. Understand that I only plant in the rainy season though. I don't plant during the summer. I haven't. I haven't been successful with that. I have quite the Darwinian approach to planting. If I plant and I discover that, oh, planting in the summer, I lose a lot of plants. I stop planting in the summer and I just plant during the rainy season. Someone's asking about moths. They are exactly as helpful as butterflies when it comes to gardens. Because moths get a bad rap, we don't, I, I didn't talk about them as much. They're in the same larger family known as Lepidoptera. They have the same kind of life cycle. They tend to pollinate plants at night. So they're an important pollinator in that respect. Butterflies tend to pollinate during the day. Moths tend to pollinate at night. Moths like white flowers and scented flowers. That's who they're attracted to. So they are just as important to birds though the caterpillars are just as delicious. And frankly, I think some of our moths are just spectacularly beautiful. So thank you for caring about this. Thank you for uh, being new to this. It's, it's still good. Calscape will include information not only on the butterflies, but also the moths. They'll include all of those species. What else do we have? Is Oh, you've got Bumblebee Watch. Uh, Bonnie's asking about Bumblebee Watch. Yeah, if, so Bonnie's asked about registering her nest on Bumblebee Watch, that would be wonderful. Every time you use a citizen science tool, Bumblebee Watch, Monarch Watch, um, Western Monarch Watch, iNaturalist, eBird, every time you do that, you are helping researchers gather the enormous amount of data we need to help land managers make better decisions. We used to plant in ways that didn't support our ecosystem. Organizations can be slow to change. So it helps people, land managers, other home gardeners, 
to make better decisions when we have access to more citizen science data. I take a lot of data about, I, I'm not as good at taking some of the insect pictures that I'd like as I'd like to be because I tend to squeal a lot. <laughs> I see an insect, but I want to get better. And I'm interested in which native plants are being put into our parks that support our ecosystems. So I tend to photograph that. But as each one of us photographs the things that we're interested in and then adds that to an existing citizen science project, it helps researchers so much to understand the changes in our landscape that are happening, happening in, real, in real time. So Bonnie, thank you for adding that information about Bumblebee Watch, that's wonderful. Kathleen, you did ask if you could print out the material from me. The material on our website for the California Native Plant Society Year Babuena chapter is able to be printed out and it's got more detailed information. I haven't tried to print out from YouTube yet. You might be able to take screenshots and print that out. Do we have more questions? Oh, Kate's asking, what would I say to the meadow approach, taking all your flower seeds and seeding them together versus planting things in clumps? The meadow approach is wonderful. They're both wonderful. Having the native plants is what's important. You can do your own research in terms of walking around versus the clumps. The bees and the butterflies are frankly sufficiently desperate that they'll find it, especially if you have that year round flower buffet. They'll stay in your landscape and they'll figure out where the food is. They would, they would rather just roll out of bed and have breakfast than have to go search for it. So if you happen to think a meadow is pretty or prettier than clumps, you should do that and see how that's different from your friends who are planting in clumps. Then take some, some photographic data, add it to iNaturalist and say, and, and let us know if meadows worked well versus clumps. Kate, adding compost to rocky soil, uh, it wouldn't hurt, but, but the plants that are adapted to rocky soil aren't expecting compost and compost has got a lot of nutrients in it. Because we have serpentine soil or, or serpentine rocks, I don't think and I don't plant on serpentine, so I'm not a serpentine expert. I have seen a list of serpentine plants, but my understanding is you shouldn't need to add compost to that, but you do need to plant in the rainy season to make sure that, that you're successful. For our monarchs, Lynn, please only plant the narrow leaf milkweed. Do not plant the showy milkweed or the swamp milkweed. Don't plant those, those East Coast milkweeds or the East, or east of the Rocky milkweeds. My mother was planting those in Texas. They're gorgeous, but they're not good for our local monarchs. The most healthy milkweed we can plant is the narrow leaf milkweed. And it blooms for a really long time. It's very robust in terms of being drought tolerant. And it's a big attractor for, in, in terms of having shallow nectar for a lot of butterflies. So it's a great thing to plant. Please, just the narrow leaf milkweed. Uh, climate zone for your neighborhood, Midtown Terrace near Sutro Tower. Your hill is rocky and clay. I don't know. I would recommend that you go to the San Francisco Department of Environment website they've, and, and San Francisco Plant Finder, they call it SF Plant Finder. They've got an air, a, a map of the plant communities. And where did we have that? They've got a plant community map that we borrowed from. All of these maps are from the San Francisco Plant Finder. So they'll help you understand what you've got if you've got a rocky clay hill, you may have some combination of a serpentine grassland and an oak woodland where the oak stuff goes onto the clay and the serpentine grassland goes onto the rock. What else do we have? Um, 
Do we have any more questions? Oh, how often to water native plants in pots? The short answer is every day. And the long answer is it depends. They need, they all expect a dry summer, but our summer is very, very dry. I tend to let my pots just dry up in the summer, but if you want them to live a little longer and bloom a little longer, then water them a little bit every day. You can also water once a week. Keep in mind that especially that the annuals will just keep blooming because they'll think, oh my gosh, it's a good rain year, why not? The bulbs expect a little bit, bit of a dry season, so give them at least a couple of months to be dry, say July and August. The succulents, I have never grown a succulent, so I don't know how to water those in a pot. You might try once a week and see how that works. Is there anybody else uh, who could answer, who could put some information on how to manage succulents in pots? I know they work, but I haven't done them myself. Where can you find out if you're too close to the coast for milkweed you're in Vallejo? You're fine. You can grow it in Vallejo. I just can't. Oh, I'm assuming this is Vallejo the city, not Vallejo the part of town. So if you're in Vallejo in San Francisco, you can't, you can't grow it. Just grow those other wonderful flat flowers like the seaside daisy. But if you're in Vallejo, the town, you can grow milkweed. You have the orange milkweed. Wait until it stops blooming and then pull it out. Right now it's blooming, it's providing nectar to, to critters. If you see a caterpillar on it, um, you might wanna contact the monarch organization. They might wanna move your caterpillar to the narrow leaf milkweed. But in the meantime, don't pull it out until, until the fall. Let's see. Ah, Lynn, thank you. You have succulents and pots. You wait to water until they start looking droopy. Thank you so much for including that. I didn't know. More questions. Do you have more questions? Okay, we, we're past one o'clock. If there are no further questions, thank you all for tuning into this. There will be more answers on Calscape. There's more answers on the Xerxes YouTube channel, Santa California Native Plant Society. Santa Clara Valley has a very effective and helpful YouTube channel as well with gardening for natives. The Marin chapter has a wonderful planting for natives as well. Thank you all for coming. Susan has so much information. And like we said in the chat, if you didn't catch it, it's available on our YouTube right now. You can watch it all over again. I love Susan's voice. I'm very relaxed now. And I just want to go sit out with my succulents. Again, thank you all. Thank you, California Native Plant Society. We appreciate you being here. And check out all of our events and register. You notice when you register, you get a few more perks. So you'll get my email. And thank you, Susan and Bob.